Good morning. <laughs> I'm Ann Walters Robertson, Dean of the Division of the Humanities, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to Humanities Day and to this year's keynote address. Today's event marks the 38th year that we've gathered on a Saturday to celebrate humanistic ideas and research. Humanities Day began in 1980 as a recruitment tool geared toward attracting an audience of prospective students. But what we've found to be true over the years, over the decades really, is that the humanities has a devoted fan base of intellectually curious attendees from the University of Chicago and beyond. Our audience these days consists of hundreds of current students, faculty members, alumni, and community members like yourselves. Each one of you here today has a stake in the humanities, whether you spend your work day examining Sanskrit texts or sending important emails to clients, and whether you spend your leisure time exploring art museums or playing video games. Regardless of our backgrounds, professions, and other individual differences, we are all connected by a shared interest in the cultural production of our fellow humans. Today, as you learn more about the various topics of study ranging from ancient Mesopotamian law to Goethe to Buddhist narratives, I want you also to think about the humanities as a mode of study or a practice of knowledge. The search for knowledge, self-evidently, is a never-ending quest. We will never know everything, but perhaps enlightenment is best thought of in terms of seeking the right questions rather than the right answers. This is intellectual curiosity at its purest and best, and that curiosity is what drives Humanities Day every year. As part of this annual celebration of the humanities, each year we select a distinguished member of our faculty to deliver a keynote address based on their current research. This year, it is my honor to introduce Larry F. Norman, the Frank L. Salzberger Professor in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures, the Committee on Theater and Performance Studies, and the College. Larry earned his bachelor's degree from New York University, and after pursuing advanced coursework and degrees from the École Normale Supérieure Rue d'Homme in Paris and the Université de Paris IV de Sorbonne, he received his PhD in French from Columbia University in 1996. He joined the University of Chicago as an assistant professor in 1995 and has spent his entire professional career on this campus. A specialist in 17th and 18th century literature, theater, and intellectual history, Larry's research often focuses on works that play with social norms and literary expectations in surprising ways. This approach has taken him from Moliere and the birth of modern satirical comedy in his first book, The Public Mirror, Moliere and the Social Commerce of Depiction, to the creative conflict between ancient literature and early modern ideals in his 2011 work, The Shock of the Ancient, Literature and History in Early Modern France, which won the Modern Language Association's 2011 Aldo and Jean Scaglione Prize for French and Francophone Studies. Larry has also edited or co-edited important volumes on the history of the book in the age of the theater and the visual arts of the Baroque era. Larry is keenly interested in engaging the public and bringing his scholarship to new audiences. As chair of the Court Theater Faculty Advisory Council, Larry and his colleagues collaborate with the Court Theater to share their insights at each season's performances. He also has curated or co-curated exhibitions for the Library Special Collections Department and the Smart Museum of Art. His work as co-curator of the Smart Museum's spring exhibition called Classicisms informs much of his talk today. Entitled Classicisms, Varieties of an Aesthetic Experience, Larry's keynote address focuses on the French classical age of Louis XIV but will take us through, through a number of directions as we find the influence of classicism throughout history. 
There is no better guide for this journey than Larry Norman. Please join me in welcoming my always insightful colleague to the stage, Larry Norman. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Anne, for that too kind uh, introduction. It's really wonderful uh, to be here uh, today. And uh, I'd like to start with my uh, title, uh, Classicisms, uh, Varieties of an Aesthetic Experience. So uh, starting with the plural, uh, classicism uh, as a notion is associated with authoritative models uh, in the Western tradition, particularly the Greco-Roman model, uh, and with ideals of simplicity, order, transparency, clarity, harmony, uh, that seem to suggest uh, that it has as a notion an incredible authoritative unity. But in fact, uh, the notion of classicism uh, is as diverse, uh, is multiple, uh, as any other aesthetic term you can think of, uh, like the Baroque. Uh, it varies from time to place, uh, within the history and across cultures. Uh, today I'm going to concentrate uh, largely, but we'll, we'll move beyond, uh, sort of with the early modern Renaissance to uh, uh, late Enlightenment uh, versions of the classical. Uh, but I want to give a broader uh, spectrum of, of thought uh, for that. And there I just want to mention this plurality uh, of meanings is also a plurality of disciplines and approaches and the importance of being at the University of Chicago. You're going to be hearing uh, throughout the day colleagues from different departments. And it's been my pleasure in this project uh, to work with scholars and graduate students from across the fields here, English, art history, cinema and media studies, Germanic studies. Um, and much of that work came together uh, with our exhibition at the Smart Museum. And I'm show a few of the uh, uh, images that were in there so you get a sense of the richness of our holdings right here on campus. And I hope you can go to the Smart uh, before or after one of your talks uh, today. That's the plural of classicisms. Uh, now, varieties of an aesthetic experience. I think the varieties goes with the plurality, but I want to stress aesthetic experience. Why? Well, the idea of the classical can be thought of as something uh, inherent, a quality that the work contains, a quality uh, produced by its maker, by the poet, by the sculptor, uh, by the painter. Uh, and in that sense, uh, it is linked traditional ideas of poetics or art making. Uh, but by switching the term in a way from the producer or the object to the receiver, our aesthetic experience, uh, our perception of the object, uh, I want to kind of twist this around uh, and think about the classical or classicisms in terms of relationships. It is a relationship that we have with an object. Uh, thus, the shifting ideas of what the classical are according to each period, we rename them uh, according to our time or perception. And that's inherent in the very term aesthetic, which is an invention of the 18th century, 18th century philosophy, uh, to turn away from traditional discussions of art uh, making or poetics and to the science and philosophy of perception. Aesthesis. Uh, you can think of the term anesthetic, not to feel. It simply means to feel, sensorial perception. And so uh, throughout the course of this, I, as I show a lot of images, I'd like you to be thinking about your own experience of those images. And I'll be looking at certain different objects and how we might experience them, but also at the same object in different contexts, in different versions, and the different kinds of experiences that we can have of them. That's my general introduction. I have a second part of my introduction, which is just to begin to think a little bit about the history and uh, theory of classicism as a notion, as an idea. And then I'm going to turn uh, to some case studies, as I mentioned. The word itself is an invention of the early 19th century, classicism. Uh, it was never used before, like many isms, their inventions of late enlightenment, early uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, thought. Uh, but it comes from a transition, a major metamorphosis of its root word, classic or classical. 
in English. We have both terms. Many languages only have one adjectival form. Until the very end of the 18th century, uh, classic meant that which is the highest in its genre, an authoritative model. A classic author was, uh, it was often misunderstood the etymology as being uh, authors or works that were taught in class. Uh, it's another etymology of class, the highest class, the very best. It wasn't associated with a particular historical period because there were modern classics. It wasn't associated with a particular aesthetic style. Uh, it was just the best. What happened in the late 18th and early 19th century was uh, there was a fermentation around aesthetics and an idea of a new historical category uh, which was called the Romantic. And the Romantic uh, opposed itself to, in many ways, the ancient or what it called the classic. And that very self-consciously changed the meaning of the term as to that which is not romantic. Now, I will uh, get into uh, what that means uh, in a second, but romanticism was understood to be a kind of modern freedom, expressive of the complex interiority of the modern tortured soul, whereas the classical expressed a sort of pure, external, simple expression of human action as is thought to be represented most ideally in Greek sculpture. Think of the Venus de Milo, we'll look at some of these, the Apollo Belvedere, that pure, harmonious incarnation in external artistic form of an ideal. That was the, the new sense of the classical. The romantic, on the other hand, was the expression of a tortured relationship uh, with nature, with oneself, which then expressed itself in art forms that were highly irregular rather than regular, that could often uh, be even ugly in certain ways, grotesque, uh, the excesses of the Gothic, rather than harmonious, pure, and uh, revelatory of a sort of noble simplicity. Now, English has a wonderful way to distinguish these two still coexisting meanings. Uh, it's not perfect, but we have classic and classical. This doesn't exist in uh, other uh, Romance languages or indeed in, in German, uh, where there's just classic, classique in French, classische in German. Uh, and it can help us think what I'm talking about today from classicism is the classical as an aesthetic or historical category. And again, it's very complex. It has many meanings, but it's not just the authoritative model. So an easy distinguisher would be we say Coke classic, right? Uh, when we say Coke classic, we're referring to the traditional authoritative model of Coke upon which all others are based. If I refer to classical Coke, I would seem to be maybe referring to a Coke that was reminiscent of Greco-Roman art or whose taste notes had a noble simplicity and quiet grandeur about them. You understand the difference. In terms of French classicism, for example, if I say it's a French classical work, we understand it's part of a period that's associated with the classical in France or has certain aesthetical qualities. If I say that's a classic French remark, I mean someone has just said, I don't know, ooh la la, or something that is sort of the authoritative model. It's, a, it's a somebody on a bicycle with a baguette and a beret on their head. So you understand this difference. And th there were various uses in the 19th century as this term developed. So now I'm kind of passing from its invention. Um, people talked about classicality and classicity. So in a sense, what I'm going to talk about today is classicality, the quality of being classical, even though that has many meanings, and not just classicity, uh, or classicicity would be better because it's a classic, uh, the quality of simply being an authoritative model. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about Stairway to Heaven, which is obviously a classic, but whether it's classical or not is a question that we can debate. Um, this term classicism then denoted uh, that which was classical, but in the early 19th century and throughout the mid-19th century, it was actually a pejorative term because it meant simply a conformism to classical models from Greece and Rome or from modern models. It really meant conformity, and it was only in the later 19th century with the development of literary history as a scientific field and art history that classicism became a neutral term uh, to talk about historical and aesthetic categories. That's where it brings us up, in a sense, to the larger 20th century modern world. Now, I'd like to now think about uh, what classicism can, can mean. And I want to think maybe three broad rubrics. 
The first two are broadly historical. They have to do with historical perception or historical consciousness. The third is aesthetic. So the first historical uh, sense is simply uh, the classical or classicism relates uh, to a historical period, an epic, which represents an apex of a certain culture. Uh, so this, of course, is first in a certain reading of uh, European uh, history refers to Greek, Greek cl classicism or Greco-Roman classicism. But you have many other classicisms. So I want to mention two, and this will get me started with the first slide, historical apexes. Uh, so I'm particularly interested in the French case, it, which is that of what is called French classicism. Of the 17th century, it is the age of the Sun King, Louis XIV and Versailles. It just so happens that this moment of cultural glory coincides with the political and military domination of France over Europe. This is no surprise. This is often uh, found to be in tandem. And we'll come back to some of the ideological and political considerations here. Uh, this is a picture of Versailles. The French have gone so far in an understanding of the late 17th century as a moment of cultural apex that to say classicism in French, classicisme, is to refer to the French 17th century, the age of Versailles. Let me make this clear. In French, if you want to refer to Greek classicism, you have to say classicisme grec. Because if you just say classicisme, you're talking about 17th century France. They have created a cultural moment which effaced the past model and created a new one superimposed on it. We'll see some images that illustrate this idea. Now, once you have this idea of a cultural apex, you then begin to date everything as leading up to it and being declined from it, right? Uh, and in this sense, you develop theories of the preparation, the archaic, the pre-classical, and the decay afterwards into Baroque or Romantic forms of dissolution, right? And we can all question, but you can see that's why classicism got a bad rap in the 19th century. Romantics like Victor Hugo, working on Les Miserables and trying to modernize art in the novel, saw this, I'm not decadent, I'm doing something new. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, that uh, historical sense. Now, here's another classical uh, model in terms of historiography and chronology. This is uh, the site of Teotihuacan, uh, in central Mexico, about 20 miles north of Mexico City. Uh, they flourished as what is considered the first great classical Mesoamerican civilization in the first half, first half of the first millennium. Uh, uh, so that's to say from basically the first century to the sixth century AD. This has become such a strong marker in Mesoamerican studies that all chronologies of the period are dated from what we could call the zero degree of the classical. You're either before it or you're after it. And you try to map all cultures onto it. So this is a timeline you can find many such, but that I took a picture of in the wonderful uh, National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. Uh, and I know it's very hard to read, but what's wonderful is this this movement, this idea of preparation and then decline uh, has to be further nuanced. So you have broadly here a period that is pre-classical before 100 AD, then you have a classical period, and then you have a post-classical period. But of course the classical period itself has a proto classical period and an epi-classical period, early and late classicism. But that's all part of the classical period. B before it, you have the pre-classical. Right? But the pre-classical begins with early pre-classical, moves to me middle pre-classical, and then to late pre-classical. The same thing with the post-classical, which ends up with post-terminal post-classical, which is a condition I hope none of you ever suffer from. <laughs> so, I, I, I want a very strong, I think you got a good sense of how this periodization works. Second, that was all just the first of the possible definitions of the classical or classicism as a historical periodization. The second historical sense is a, not one of historical fixity, but of historical movement, transmission, and even, I would say, circulation. 
This is the idea that the classical is that which endures. That's one of the most common definitions you see. It's a thing that, that lasts forever, that you can continue to reread and re-see uh, in the future. And there it's kind of similar to a definition of the classic. But this is, I want to really stress, a very dynamic notion. Because the endurance of the art object depends upon its reading in every future period or every different culture, which will perceive it differently. So we have a different version of even one classical object, and that's what we'll look at shortly with the case of uh, Venus of Arles, which is a great classical sculpture that you can find in the Louvre in Versailles. Um, it is reread differently according to the experience of the times, the readers, the way it's perceived. But of course, also our modern conceptions, modern in any culture at any time, change what the classical model is. So what Greco-Roman cl classical represented uh, for the 17th century is not the same as what it represents uh, today. I mean the various moments that are considered the height. So I just want to uh, get that sense of circulation, of movement. It has to do with two points in time. It has to do with a past and a present and some sense of transmission before them. And finally, it actually has to do also with a third point in time, the future. To be classical today is to understand oneself in relationship to a future, that endurance, right? So uh, the dynamism of the historical understanding of the classical. Finally, the third definition is not historical at all, although it obviously has some roots, associations with it. It's aesthetic, it's a stylistic category, and here it's meant, uh, it's understood uh, to be that uh, which I've mentioned before, that which represents a kind of grand simplicity, a sort of perfection of form, a transparency. Uh, so we'll be looking at some Venuses. Think of your famous sculpture of Venus. It represents, that sculpture represents in material form an ideal of human perfection perfectly. No more complexity. We don't have to worry. What is, when you look at a Venus, the Venus de Milo, for example, you're not thinking necessarily, some of you may, what is she thinking, right? What's going on in that tortured mind of Venus? Why is she twisting around? What's that odd curl on her lip? No, it's simply an immediate, harmonious expression of what it represents. Now think, oddly enough, painting is often associated with the romantic, sculpture with the classical, painting with the romantic, and we'll see that in a minute. Think about the Mona Lisa, for example, very different experience, right? Again, in perception. Now, you could look at the two together, you know, in the same way, but most people will look at the Venus, will look at the Mona Lisa and say, what is going on in that mind? What is that smile? What is that nuanced curl? What complexity is there? Not the same sense. Okay, that concludes my three definitions of the classical. And I'd now like to look at a work of the early, uh, 19th century. This is a work by the great neoclassical uh, painter Ingres. Uh, you can find it in the, in the Louvre Museum. Uh, and it represents uh, Homer deified. There is Homer. Uh, he's receiving the crown as prince of the poets. And he's surrounded by lots of sort of an mostly ancient figures, but we'll see. There's a few moderns. There's a great Greek temple in the background. This was uh, the period of the early 19th century, which followed the mid-18th century discoveries in Herculaneum, in Pompeii. It was the beginning of the opening of Greece, although still under Ottoman Im imperial control, for archaeological investigation. People were going back and trying to get a more exact idea of what Greek architecture was. It's still idealized, but we'll see. This is not the same as what the Renaissance did. There's a certain kind of historical effort here, archaeological and reproducing, almost in, archae in a kind of archaeological regularity, what a lyre would have looked like. It's a little different than a Renaissance lyre, which would be more modern. Uh, then the figures here, we see actually the idea of different moments of classicism. Uh, the first being Greek classicism. Okay, now it's Homer. He was a little bit before, but he represented it. It's a little archaic to be true. Uh, then we have uh, uh, here two figures, Apelles, representing the, the great Greek painter, leading forward Raphael. So Raphael representing Renaissance classicism, that moment of the early 16th century that was the height of Italian uh, culture. 
And then at the bottom, what do we have? Leading us in. First, I'll just mention we have the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad has a sword, the Odyssey has an oar, the two books allegorically represented. But then in order to, at our eye, remember these paintings were, were held up high. So at our eye level, our closest to us, introducing and allowing us to move upward, one man pointing directly up to Homer and the books, the other man offering a book uh, to these deified ancients, are the 17th century French classical artists and writers, right? Uh, this is Poussin, the great painter. Uh, this is Moliere, of whom I wrote a book, <laughs> right here. Uh, we have uh, Boileau, the great critic. Um, so that is the sense the French classicism has now become, in a way, the one closest to us in this hierarchy, and the one through which we can now accede to the past. So, we have here, actually, all three elements of classicism, or neoclassicism, of which I've spoken. We have an idea of historical periodization. Only the great periods are up here. We have the idea, though, of circulation, transmission. How do you get there through the different layers? How do we rethink the past in terms of the future? And finally, we have the idea of a sort of uh, sim noble simplicity and clarity of composition that's typical of the classical style. Just to be clear, 1827, uh, Angra is representing the neoclassical school against the modern romantic school of painters like Jericho. I didn't bring a painting by Jericho, but it's a big mess of bloody bodies and wild creatures uh, with loose brush strokes. Look at this, just the opposite, intended to represent uh, those elements of clarity and uh, simplicity of style. Now, I do want to just give a sense of the complexity of the relationship with the past here and remind you, you may have thought of this, Angra is paying homage and visibly reworking two of the great works of Raphael. In a sense, I'll come back to this, the most immediate in terms of subject matter in the Raphael stanza in uh, the Vatican is the Parnassus, which has Apollo in the middle and all the great uh, poets and painters. This is the artistic one. But he's actually uh, modeled it more in terms of its pictorial layout on the School of Athens. Uh, which is found in the same room, which was dedicated to the philosophers and thinkers. But you see here the makeup. It has the, the same stairway, the same steps. Uh, it has the figures, and it has the classical architecture. So, a couple of things to note. Raphael didn't put uh, modern uh, figures explicitly in there, although Raphael used contemporary figures as models in terms of their faces, Michelangelo, da Vinci, so on, are, are in there, but playing roles from the past. But I also just want to stress this architecture. The architecture here is Roman, ancient Roman, right? Uh, it's not Greek. The curve, the arched uh, uh, gallery, the dome in the background, uh, these are all later Roman, so it's the School of Athens, but with architecture that you wouldn't have seen in Athens in the 5th century BC. You'll notice that, uh, uh, Pus, uh, that Angra is more neoclassical than the neoclassicist. I'd like to uh, quickly read with you uh, one text, because I think it's important, I'm going to be showing a lot of images, uh, to look at this birth of the notion of the classical. Uh, as I mentioned, vented in late uh, 18th century, turn of the 19th century in Germany, particularly generally credited to the Schlegel brothers, who were theoreticians of the history of art and literature, uh, and very much theorizing what Romanticism was, but also rethinking what the classical was. Associated with the Schlegel brothers was a great French author, uh, Germaine de Stahl. And de Stahl uh, worked closely with them and brought all of this new fermentation from Kant uh, through the, 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 the Schlegels, the beginnings of the, you know, from Lessing, uh, Schiller, Goethe, brought this to France in a book called On Germany in 1810. Because before that, they, you know, they just thought Teutonic barbarity, paid no attention to Germany. But also, by bringing this to France, brought it to Europe. Because French was, at that time, the universal language of the cultivated public, which German was not yet. So de Stahl's work was important throughout Europe in bringing this idea. And 
she starts this passage, uh, which was the first time romantic was used as an aesthetic category in language, in French, right? There, it had existed before, but in a general meaning related to romance. And she says, the word romantic has lately been introduced in Germany to designate that kind of poetry which owes its birth to the union of chivalry and Christianity. So I just want to make clear, we often think the romantic period, and there's true, is a movement of the late 18th, early 19th century, right? But it understood the romantic spirit to be modern in the broadest sense. Everything that's post-pagan, post-classical, the classical, ended with the fall of Rome, with the rise of Christianity, came about the new romantic spirit. Uh, we some, now here she's going to say I'm using the word differently. We sometimes use the word classique as synonymous with perfection. When she says sometimes, that's basically all the time. I use it at present in a different meaning, definition, acceptation. Considering classical poetry that of the ancients and romantic that which is generally connected with the traditions of chivalry. This division is equally suitable to the two eras, eras of the world, that which preceded and that which followed the establishment of Christianity. So this broadly, Hegel's lectures on aesthetic, enormous influence uh, written in the next decade. Basically, the definitions of classical and romantic are that. Classical is pre-Christian. Romantic is Christian art, which embraces the Christian. Here she associates it with a Christian religion, we'll get to that in a second, but with chivalry also. So here the idea is those romances, medieval romances, which depend upon an extremely elaborate, refined, and interiorized notion of love, of romantic love. And according to all these authors, they're probably wrong, it didn't exist in antiquity. They didn't know what romantic love was. They understood passion, so they could understand jealousy. So you could have Medea, you know, mad with jealousy, consumed with passion for Jason. You can have Phaedra, who we'll look at in a second, the great heroine married to Theseus, who fell in love by a curse of Venus uh, with her stepson, who she didn't want to fall in love with at all, burns with passion uh, and kills herself from it. Yes. That existed, but romantic love, which is all about who am I, who are you, uh, how do we make this work, uh, really, and, you know, and all the complications around that, that's modern, that's romantic, and that comes about with chivalry, okay, medieval. Now, in various German works, ancient poetry has been compared to sculpture, romantic to painting. I think I already discussed this with the comparison of, say, of Venus de Milo with uh, da Vinci's Mona Lisa. The sculptural is a pure representation of the gods, of heroes, of human perfection incarnated perfectly physically. Painting expresses nuance, shades of character. And this is also in keeping with the next line. In short, the progress of the human mind has been characterized in every manner, passing from material religions, that's paganism, which worships the deity in incarnated forms as gods and then re reproduces them in sculptures to those which are spiritual. That's Christianity, according to her. From nature, the physical world, which is what Homer is all about, to deity, to an abstract understanding of the metaphysical universe. All right. Now, I, think, I hope this is good. Last line. The French nation certainly the most cultivated of all of those derived from Latin origins. The French were never noted for extreme humility. Um, but I want to you know, note uh, from Latin origins. So she's making the comparison here only with really Italy and Spain, Portugal, um, Romance languages. Inclines toward classical poetry imitated from the Greeks and Romans. And there again, you get this idea of the French classicism is a classicism that has a direct lineage, but she is actually uh, beginning to, you know, if not denounce this classicism, to show its limitations and to say we need to think more about the romantic associated with the Germans, with the English, uh, with a more native uh, spiritual understanding of the world. Now, we're still staying in the early 19th century, and I want to look at a beautiful work uh, from uh, the Smart Museum. 
This is a, a portrait of Monsieur Fauvel, who's your main figure, who was the French ambassador uh, in Athens uh, to the Ottoman Empire uh, uh, in 1820, when this is painted, uh, still under Ottoman uh, control. He was also a noted archaeologist. He had assembled in his home and gardens in the Forum below the Acropolis, that's the Acropolis you see above us, uh, an incredible collection of ancient works of art. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. That's one of the uh, mitopes uh, from the Parthenon frieze, so one of the sculpted panels, all of which, uh, as you know, can be found in the British Museum. Uh, it, we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, he collected those. Um, and he's painted by a certain Louis Dupré, who was a student of David, representing uh, that neoclassical style that Angra will later represent. But there's a real merging here in this early 19th century painting of classical or neoclassical tendencies and romantic ones. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's just start at the top. That's the Acropolis. Now, remember Angre with the Greek temple, right? Uh, where is, where's the Parthenon? It's, it's a little something up here in ruins, okay? It is a modern, it's a realistic depiction of Athens, and it stresses the uh, medieval and early modern remains of Athens, right? Not the classical purity. It is interested in the medieval and modern. Then, he's in lovely modern dress, quite classical in the sense of quite simple, harmonious, uh, pure, and next to him uh, is a serving woman, um, Probably in traditional garb, uh, there's a debate about whether it's Albanian or Armenian among art historians. Uh, but this is very interesting because Fauvel and Louis Dupre both were very interested in local contemporary customs. They were going around and drawing what the people were wearing. And that's a very romantic obsession. It's not the idealized uh, model, but the interest in contemporary folklore. Right? And then finally, I want to stress, and this is where I'm going to go uh, next in terms of perceptions of the classical, uh, this object that he has. This is actually a plaster cast because in 1820, when this is painted, Lord Elgin had already made off with most of the metopes, uh, these sculpted panels from the Parthenon and taken them to Britain. Right? Now, We'll see in a second, uh, Mr. Fauvel managed to get a couple of things out, including a panel uh, that was sent to Paris. What's really interesting to me is that this is shown in its plaster cast form as in its original as an unrestored, ruined object. Okay? That was a radical thing, and that was an invention of the early 19th century. This is just a quick, you know, give you a sense, I'm sorry, it's far away, but this is a modern sculpture, but everything's complete. But in Versailles, you know, you have these wonderful alleys. They're filled with ancient art. If they're original, which some of them were in the uh, 17th century when this was constructed, they were all restored. No one wanted to walk through a garden in the 17th or 18th century and see an armless woman. It just, no, they want classical perfection. But a new romantic sense of the tortured relationship to the past, of the organic uh, life of a work of art with its own birth and slow decay, of the materiality and not just the ideality of that object arises precisely in the early 19th century. This is the object that you saw there. This is the original in the British Museum that Lord Elgin got out. And um, I want to make very clear, this is the first time, it was sent to the British Museum in 1816, that a major art historical event was celebrated without a restoration. Before you would have restored, all of the Parthenon marbles were kept in unrestored form. And there was a lot of debate. And you better believe the first thing we're talking about in 1810 is who are we going to get to restore these? How are we going to restore them? How are we going to make them look good again? But the public and the art world said, no, let's do it like this. Um, a different way of perceiving the ancient. Now, 
Uh, these raise important questions, our attachment to originality. I just want to make a, a note here. This, you see a plaster cast of the objects, now hangs in the new Acropolis Museum in Greece, which was built in order to provide a home for the marbles when they are going to come back from Britain, which according to Britain, will be never. Um, and so this important discussion, but also our understanding of art in copy form. This is very important. Think about the classical as something that is repeated. We reread a classical art. We reread it, a classical piece of poetry, for example, we read in different editions. But the classical sculpture, we see in copies very often. I'll talk more about that in a second. Now, this is the uh, Parthenon marble that uh, Louis Dupre, the man we just saw back there, managed to get out and send to France. But guess what happened? He sent this to France in the late 1790s, and at that point, uh, there were the wars around the French Revolution, uh, which meant that there, and then, or this is the early Napoleonic period. It's still the Republic, but Napoleon has become consul and soon emperor. War is breaking out all over. It gets stopped by British agents on the way to France. Who gets a hold of it? Lord Elgin. Lord Elgin was going to get it off to his collection, but decided in a moment of diplomatic or art historical collegiality to send it back to France. It was very nice of him. And it is in the Louvre. You can see this in the Louvre in this form today, but it arrives in the Louvre in the early 19th century. They were not yet as advanced as the British in the sense of moving to the new ruined uh, imagination of the classical, so it was restored. And until uh, the uh, very late 19th century, you saw this in restored form, not in its original form. And then what did they do? They de-restored, right? This is a very important part. This shows the shifts in, in our understanding of what the classical is. First, you had to restore it to make it ideal, like what the Greeks saw. Then you had to de-restore it so you saw only what the Greeks saw with no modern additions, and you understood that ruin. Now, the problem is, and we're going to look at something, the, the art of restoration was such a fabulous art that they ended up chopping off beautiful restorations done by artists like Bernini. So a current trend in the last de decade has been in undi-restoring, <laughs> uh, re-restoring, ancient works of art, because now we have an appreciation of that hybridity of the classical object. Venus de Milo. This was another one. <laughs> this is in the Louvre. Uh, 1820, Fauvel was the ambassador. He didn't discover it, but he's the one. He went to the docks in Athens on its way to Paris, saw it, said that it was the greatest classical work. He said it must have been by Proxiteles. It's not. It's by a later's Hellenistic art, but I won't go into all that. Uh, but said, this is it. This is great. He was very happy to be able to sign off on this. It goes to the Louvre, and immediately it's looked at as one of the greatest works of classical Greek art. And of course, the discussion is, how do we restore it? So people are drawing, you know, what's her arms, what is she doing? And you saw throughout Europe little models of her made, restored. Goethe, you can go to the Goethe house in Weimar, collected one of the restored Venus de Milo, hot from Paris. We discovered a new great uh, 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 sculpture, but it was restored. Now, the fact is, this is a turning point. In 1820, the debates go on for about a decade, and then they say, no, this is how we want to keep her. So she was never restored. Now, I now want to turn back to the period earlier of French classicism in the 17th century and look at this example of the Venus of Arles. Here you see her in the Louvre Museum. Just want to point out her placement. Where is this Venus? She is in the same galleries as the Venus de Milo, the Venus of Milo. There she is. See her? Can you make out that little object back there? Yeah, that's, that's just in the back. Sorry, hand-done photography, uh, but there's not a good image with both of them. So, very important sculpture. Discovered in the mid-17th century in the southern city of Arles. This is a Roman uh, sculpture. Uh, an adaptation is the word that's used today more uh, than imitation. 
or at least imitation, not copy. For a long time, people just said they were Roman copies of, but they had their own style of adapting the originals, but of a, of a model that's assumed to be by Praxiteles in the uh, late fourth, mid fourth century BC, so sort of late classical Greek, but just right away found in a Roman theater. So what Greco-Roman classicism are we talking about? We're actually talking about a work of Roman imperial classicism. Arl was a very important city of immigrants from Italy and from throughout the Roman Empire because Augustus built this town in order to be a retirement community for his armies. So it was a very multicultural community. Um, I just want to kind of stress this past that produced this. Now, if you go to see it in the Louvre, and again, I'm entering into a, a section on the Venus of Arles, and we're going to see the many different ways that one can perceive her. If you go to see her in the Louvre, you will see at the bottom a plaque that says, Praxiteles, sculpture, mid -fourth, sculptor, mid-4th century B.C. Then you have to kind of look over to the side. Oh, Venus of Arles. Oh, it's actually a work of the 1st century B.C., the very late first century BC under Augustus, right? So the way we go through a gallery and we say that's Greek art. Now, it's not entirely a wrong impression. However, uh, we can actually in certain ways more accurately go through that gallery and say this is a Roman work. But it isn't a Roman work. It isn't a Greek work. There's a basis. There's a torso. It's a work of the French 17th century because the Venus was originally found um, without her arms. I'm going to skip ahead. The blue represents the modern additions. So she was brought up uh, from Arles to Louis XIV, who decided that she was the greatest representative, and he wanted to place her in uh, his Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. But he wasn't going to place a ruined fragment there. So he needed to give her arms. Now, here's the other problem. She didn't have arms. And when you don't have arms, you don't have an insignia. One of the ways we can determine or attribute what a figure is is to see if it's a Diana, she's going to be holding a bow and arrow. If it's a Venus, she might have an apple because of the contest of the goddesses. That's her sign that she won uh, over... Uh, Juno uh, and Diana, or she would have a mirror because she's beauty and she likes to look at herself. They didn't know what she was. And actually, when she was discovered, they thought that she was a Diana. So Louis XIV said to his Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, decide what this is and fix it up. Well, at this time, there was such a public passion. This is going to go into the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. This is one of the great finds of the century, one of the beautiful, that the, what was the New Yorker of the time, which was really the only week monthly publication called the Mercure Galant, which was for a cultivated but non-scholarly reading public, devoted a number of issues to the debate, Diana or Venus. One issue featured a number of little poems called madrigals in which writers took the position of Diana or Venus arguing against each other, right? Uh, it's me, it's Venus, it's not that cold, nasty Diana who doesn't know how to melt. Uh, and Diana responds, oh, you lascivious creature. Um, <laughs> I'm not, how could you think that I'm that loose woman, Venus, right? Uh, so you get a sense of how are we to perceive, how are we to experience this? First, what are we experiencing? The great uh, 17th century sculptor Giraudin uh, uh, made a wax model of this with, in order to make sure we understood it was Venus, with an apple in one hand and the mirror, which is broken off, in the other. Now, first of all, this sounds very Greek, but in fact, there are no Greek sculptures where she has both the apple and the mirror. It's a little insistent. Uh, but he gave her both, just so no one mistook who she was. Um, and it's very beautiful. And when Louis XIV saw the wax sculpture, he said, oh, let's go with this one. Um, and that is the way Venus has come down to us. I would now like to conclude some images and then make a couple of final remarks. How do we experience this Venus today? We can experience her 
with her arms on. There we can experience her in the Louvre, where they're still showing her, though she's in the Greek section, uh, with uh, the modern restorations. We can experience her in cast form, in copy form, in Versailles Hall of Mirror. Here she is in Versailles. You see her today. This is a copy uh, in her perfected form. We could go to Arles and see her in the town hall of Arles, a copy of her, because she's considered one of the great elements of local pride. As a matter of fact, the town hall and the city is so obsessed with the Venus, which was discovered there, that in the mayor's seat under Marianne, the little bust, uh, the representative of the French Republic, is a painting of the Venus uh, of Arl sculpture with other great figures, but much lower of Arl, including and of Provence, including Provencal poets who wrote in Provencal, not in French. Right, so she's become she's not Greek, she's not Roman, she's not French, she's Provencal, she's Arlesian. Um, and oh, next to her, next to also, I just want to point out another great classical figure, but Petrarch from Italy, the great Italian humanist who rediscovered Homer, uh, who spent a lot of time in Provence. Right? So there's another way to see her with her arms on. We can see casts of her throughout the world. This is, one is in Berlin, and the copy is very polished, uh, new uh, marbleized uh, uh, plaster cast. Or, for only 900 euros, you can purchase your own restored Venus of Arles at the Louvre gift shop. So the next time you're there, think about it. But, so these are all, she can be a consumer object, she can be an object of local pride, uh, she can be Greek, she can be Roman, she can be modern French. She can also be in her original state, armless. And here we see some of the different casts that were made of the original before it was restored. Uh, however, some of them were retouched, and I just can't uh, skip this slightly humorous story from the early 20th century as art historians were looking at different casts, here are two of them, uh, that were made uh, at the time of its discovery. But one uh, to the left has significantly larger breasts than the one to the right. And the art history, one art historian wrote a long essay about how Giradon had destroyed the original beauty of the Venus of Arles by sanding down her breasts because they weren't fitting for the courtly culture of the Sun King uh, and to give it a more demure aspect. But it was then another art historian quickly discovered that that plaster cast had been destroyed in the French Revolution and was redone afterwards with a breast augmentation uh, and therefore was not the original Venus of Arles. You can see all of these plaster casts in Versailles, but you can also see her armless again in the Museum of Arles, now looked at as a, in a museum of Gallo Provençal history, of the Roman Provence of the Antiquities, so she doesn't have her arms there. Uh, but there's also a little local pride. I won't show you the plaque, but it says, among other things, that the Venus had the misfortune of having pleased Louis XIV who took her away uh, to Versailles. So again, here you see her as a mixture of Greek artifact and element of local pride. A few concluding thoughts. I wanted to give a sense of the variety of experiences we can have with just one object, but of course, it stretches much larger than that. So to conclude, maybe three ways we can think about classicism today. Uh, in the early 21st century. What is it for us? Uh, and I'd like to talk about three rubrics very quickly. One is time, one is place, and, and one is attention. In terms of place, what are we to do with the idea of the classical in a globalized culture? Right? A lot of this arises, the word itself develops within a what was understood to be a tradition of heritage uh, from Greece and Rome to Europe and so on. We saw some of that since. It's then applied more broadly, to cultures throughout the world, East Asian uh, class of Chinese or Japanese classicism. We've seen Mesoamerican classicism. Um, can we, is there a universal classicism? And if not, which is fine, should we think about a multi-classicism for a multicultural world? That 
sounds very appealing. It's not always easy to do, but it's very important to, because one thing I haven't stressed much in this discussion are the ideological and political implications of the classical. And in this day and age, they're hard to ignore. And it has been used for various political and ideological uh, uh, purposes, including by the fascists, including by Nazis, including by racists, uh, because uh, partly simple things like these white sculptures. Well, they were polychrome originally, uh, but uh, that whiteness has been used and is being used today in Greece, as a matter of fact, by the Golden Dawn Party, the neo-Nazi party in Greece. The fact is, classicism has been used for every ideology. Uh, it is the ideology, it is the ideological marker, stylistic marker also of democracy, Athens, Roman Republic, uh, and hence uh, our Washington, D.C., right, which is filled with these uh, neoclassical monuments. It is the Republican style. It is also the fascist style, the monarchical style, uh, the Nazi style, and the Stalinist style. So we have it throughout. Now, just because it's been used by all of these doesn't mean that there isn't something special about it the Gothic, Baroque, they've all been used for bad political purposes or for a variety of political purposes. But because of its association with an authoritative style, I just want to say I, we can't let ourselves off too easily. And there's a special, I think, form of critique, critique and self-critique that should come with the classical, and that's very good, that's very healthy. It's a, it's a discipline to think about that. So that's a sort of time, globalized culture, multiculturalism, uh, uh, place. Now, time, very quickly. A lot of people today talk about living in a post-historical world. Um, and, you know, I try to look at this with my students and so on, which is to say, in the age of internet, in the age of an overwhelming present, uh, do we still have the same sense of historical difference uh, that we did uh, in the past. And since the classical depends in many ways upon, as we've talked about, an understanding of historical difference in our relationship to them, is that being effaced because we live in one historical plane, in a sense? I'm not sure that's entirely true, but I just want to ask some questions uh, to, to finish and think about. And the third uh, concluding uh, uh, question is that of attention. The classical, as we've talked about, it idealized, um, as a sculpture, it is placed most often in a niche or on a pedestal. It is something that we look at, like the Venus de Milo, with a kind of awe and a kind of concentration. And in that sense, the classical is a very contractive form. It concentrates in one object an idea of perfection. But it is also, at the same time, an extremely expansive form, because we've seen the Venus of Arles, representing so many phases of art history, uh, representing so many elements. Is it Arlesian? Is it Greek? Is it Roman? So many cultures, and one can do the same with other classical objects. So between this contractive or centripetal force of classicism, concentrating things in one object that we continually pay attention to, and this expansive form of classicism, seeing the object uh, as, in fact, an assembly of all sorts of different elements. Uh, there's a dynamic, and as much as I love the expansive side, and I love multidisciplinarity, and I love thinking about everything, the classical may offer, perhaps cleansed a little bit of some of its cultural and authoritative side, uh, a unique chance for concentration in a world in which our attention uh, in the world of hypertext uh, and internet is so often dispersed, uh, a, a form of concentrated attention and contemplation which may be a discipline for us uh, for the future. Thank you.